Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us this morning on this discussion on Iran. What's happening in Iran, popular protests, and the U.S. policy. My name is Kadir Usun. I'm the executive director here at SETA Foundation. I have a great panel of experts with me this morning. Um, just to my left, Sina Tusi is with National Iranian American Council. He's a senior research analyst there. Just to his left, Barbara Slavin is director of Future of Iran Initiative at Atlantic Council. And just to her left, we have Alex Vatanka, senior fellow with the Middle East Institute. Um, so I obviously uh, feel very humbled in their presence because they're all uh, great experts on Iran, what's happening. And I, I'm ashamed to acknowledge that I've been kind of out of the loop past couple of weeks and following Iran, I usually try to follow it as closely as possible because it's a very important subject in this town. Um, but um, for the casual observers, let's say, um, these protests kind of came out of uh, nowhere somewhat unexpectedly. So many people questioned, why is this happening? Is it is it a result of the U.S. policy? Is it a success of the U.S. policy or something else? What's happening? Is the regime going to collapse, uh, et cetera? So there have been a lot of debates. Um, uh, and then, you know, at the same time, there are uh, things happening in Lebanon, in Iraq. What is the regional dimensions of this? So I basically decided to pose my questions to an expert panel. Uh, to update myself uh, uh, on these issues, and I hope uh, I hope that this will also help us help our audience, uh, our followers also to to en to kind of enlighten themselves along with me. Thank you again for joining us, and I don't want to talk a lot more, um, but uh, we will start in the reverse order than the than it advertised in our handouts. Uh, I want to start with Sina and ask him, so what is happening in Iran right now? <laughs> Great question. Yeah, I think like the biggest question about, um, it, it's about this the gas price hike that led to the mm -hmm. protest and why it was really announced so abruptly by the government. Mm -hmm. And in Iran, you know, the government really knew that protests would erupt as a result of this gas price hike. Mm. You know, cheap gas is an integral part of the social contract in Iran between the state and the citizens. And in the past, when they've kind of raised the price of gas, they gradually prepared the citizens beforehand. Uh, they've kind of um, done direct transfers of cash subsidies kind of simultaneously with the gas price hike, which did not occur this time. Instead, this time, they announced the gas price hike on a Friday, the Iranian weekend. And as we know, immediately protests erupted. It became very violent. And you know what ensued was a very brutal government crackdown. You know, for one week in an unprecedented way for the first time they shut down the internet as we know hundreds of people were killed and i think you know there's a complex backdrop to these protests uh one is the trump administration's maximum pressure campaign that's marked by economic pressure and other forms of pressure another is this shift we're seeing in iranian internal politics in favor of more hardline forces and Overall, the reaction of the Islamic Republic to these protests shows that it's becoming more uh, iron-fisted at home and less conciliatory abroad. It's not heading in the direction of this kind of behavior change that proponents of maximum pressure purport is the aim of the policy. And I think very importantly, the tense regional climate and the geopolitical climate right now, it feeds claims of foreign interference in Iran. Of course, Iranian officials and leaders you know, most of the time when there's protests in Iran, they frame them as kind of seditionists and they kind of as kind of being puppets of some outside power. But their paranoia is being reinforced by the regime change rhetoric and actions of the Trump administration and his regional allies. And we've seen, for example, that Brian Hook, the State Department special representative for Iran, in the midst of these protests, he said that, you know, we welcome them. We're very pleased with these protests, I think were his exact words. And you know, this not only hurts the protesters in Iran, but it indicates for them that maximum pressure, one goal of it is to kind of bring people out into the streets in Iran. And I think that it's possible that the Iranian kind of leadership, they, uh, they wanted to kind of trigger and kind of nip in the butt some protests they expected. They were clearly well prepared for like mass repression. 
But I think, you know, as of, you know, there's no direct, there's no evidence of kind of direct foreign involvement in these protests. What is happening, and it was what we have seen, is that there's been intense domestic political feuding over these, the gas price hike. And increasingly, Hassan Rouhani, the president, is, is being scapegoated. And we saw initially after the gas price hike that there was a lot of contradictory accusations of Iranian kind of officials against one another. Rouhani came out and said he didn't even know the gas price hike was going to be implemented until the day it was. Khamenei, the supreme leader, said that he wasn't an expert on this issue, but he supported this, the decision because it was made by this high economic council, which is comprised of Rouhani, the judiciary chief, Ebrahim Raisi, and this parliamentary speaker, Ali Larijani. But then the judiciary chief, Raisi, who's, also, who's a hardliner, who's Rouhani's opponent in the 2017 presidential election, he came out and said that he didn't support the gas price hike, and it was a suggestion of the Rouhani administration. And we've seen that from the get-go, you know, more hardline forces in Iran, they've been vociferously attacking Rouhani over the gas price hike and trying to scapegoat, scapegoat him. Interestingly, on the first day, on that Friday when the gas price hike was announced, these kind of telegram channels, the social media kind of tool used in Iran, that are linked to the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps, they actually encourage people to abandon their cars in, pro in traffic as a form of protest against the gas price hike. Mm -hmm. So they interestingly had this kind of this role initially. And then we saw that, you know, for example, Ahmad Jannati, the head of the Guardian Council and the Assembly of Experts, is a very kind of powerful political figure in Iran. He strongly attacked Rouhani. Muhammad Ali Jafari, the, kind of the former head of the Revolutionary Guards, he attacked Rouhani as well and accused him of basically playing into kind of the enemy's hands, I think was his quote. And then in parliament, we saw Mojtaba Zonur, who's this hardline parliamentarian who's the head of the parliament's foreign policy and national security commission. He actually introduced an impeachment bill against Rouhani in that week after the gas price hike, and it gathered over 60, 60 signatures. And, you know, Zonur is someone who has compared Rouhani to uh, Bani Saad, who was the first president after the revolution in 79. And, who was actually ousted as a traitor during that time. And you know, for these hardline forces in Iran, you know, maximum pressure is a historic opportunity for them. They're in, you know, ahead of parliamentary elections next February, ahead of the presidential election the following year. They're in no urgency to support negotiations with the United States that would help Rouhani and would help the moderate centrist factions. Instead, they're overseeing this kind of unprecedented uh, anti-corruption drive right now which is really about Khamenei's kind of legacy and succession, cementing the political system and consolidating power behind these more hardline forces. And it's being spearheaded by Ebrahim Raisi, the same kind of um, the judiciary chief. And overall, you know, Trump's maximum pressure, it's really kind of debilitated the moderate and reformist factions in Iran. You know, these people like Rouhani or Zarif, who staked all of their political currency on negotiations with the West and the US under Obama, They've just, you know, they've been really debilitated. The hardline narratives have been validated. And it really is wishful thinking for Trump to think that this policy is, you know, that the regime is on its last legs or it's going to capitulate to U.S. demands. In reality, you know, what we're seeing with these protests, the Islamic Republic is becoming more kind of repressive, more insular. Maximum pressure is creating this, it's creating this environment in Iran that is totally not conducive for negotiations with the U.S., it's not creating any kind of better future for the Iranian people, a more secure, freer, prosperous future. And you know, the final result may be that kind of US-Iran hostilities are entrenched for the kind of foreseeable future and many years ahead. And Iran is going to become even more, you know, more aggressive with its nuclear program and its regional policies, which is what we've been seeing. So I'll leave Thank it you, Sina. <clears throat> we'll, we'll, I'll get back to you. But Alex, what, are, what is different about these protests than Previous ones, um, is there something qualitatively you see different uh, that could lead to some other uh, result that's unexpected? Um, yeah. Thanks, Kiri. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you. Um, what's different this time, I mean, there are a couple of things that stand out in terms of being different. One is the amount of violence we've seen. I mean, I, I think if some of the statistics that are coming out are true, they've killed more people, that's the Iranian regime, they've ki killed more people and arrested more people in seven days than they did in the seven months that it took them to crack down on the green opposition movement back in 2009. It tells yeah. you quite a bit. Why did they do it? Clearly they expected something bad is about to happen because of maximum pressure. Perhaps they're looking in the neighborhood places like Iraq and Lebanon saying to themselves a quick 
uh, and harsh crackdown is the way forward. You definitely do not want to see this um, getting out of hand. Just imagine for a second, if you are in charge of security in Iran, your budget is totally slashed because of the lack of income and so forth. You have a group or groups of young men throwing stones or burning bags in different parts of the country. If you let them continue and your other aggrieved classes join the protests, the pensioners, the teachers, the, the workers, I mean, the list is long, then you have a crisis that you can't control anymore. That's why they cracked down so harsh as they did because they want to prevent this sort of further mobilization by other segments in society. And it, you know, it works. In the short term, it will work. But the problems are going to still stay there. They haven't really solved anything in the longer term. Another thing that, that I think Kadir st stood out for me certainly was how quickly the chants and the slogans were direct directed at one man, Ayatollah Ali Khamenei. Mm -hmm. And to me, the message is clear. The younger generation of Iranian no longer see any hope for the reformist to prevail. Reform, if you ask me, I would say reformism in Iran died pretty much with Mohammad Khatami's first term back in late 1990s. But anybody who had any hopes for the so-called moderates, there are no moderates in Iran that can do anything. The question is, can you get the hardliners to make concessions or not? That's the only question really left. So that's how I see it, Kadir. Thank you. Sure. Um, Barbara, um, President Trump made a statement in London about supporting, not supporting, and then he tried to fix that uh, statement. Um, what, what is, what, what, I have a theory of my, on my own, but what, <laughs> what is your read of that? Yeah, well, first, thank you, Sita, thank for you inviting for me again to, to speak on, on, on this issue. Um, U.S. policy toward Iran has been very incoherent uh, since Trump came in. The, the only, I mean, we know that he didn't like the nuclear deal and that he was going to get rid of it at some point. Uh, and, of course, sanctions are always the favored mm -hmm. tactic of the U.S. government. But the goal of those sanctions, the goal of U.S. policy, has never really been clear. Mm -hmm. We had Secretary of State Pompeo give a list of 12 demands back in 2018, which are so broad that they were essentially a mission impossible regarding uh, Iran's nuclear program, no more enrichment, regarding Iran's regional activities, no more support for any of the groups that it's historically supported in the region. Um, we had the 12 demands. Then we have President Trump's own personal agenda, which is all about uh, you know, photo opportunities, uh, ephemeral diplomatic breakthroughs that will distract people from everything else that's going on in, in this administration. And we saw over the summer there was a flurry uh, of activity. Uh, the Japanese Prime Minister Abe, later President Macron of France, tried to arrange some sort of meeting between Trump and President Rouhani uh, that would sort of signal the beginning of a new negotiation on a new and better deal. Uh, but it never happened because the Iranians have a quid pro quo, to use a, a phrase that's been much in use lately, and that is that Trump has to agree to some sort of easing of sanctions in order for any kind of meeting to take place or any kind of new negotiation to begin. And Trump has not been willing to do that. So we saw his ambivalence about all of this, I think, very obviously demonstrated uh, in London, mm -hmm. where he was asked whether the U.S. was providing support for the protesters, and he said no, and then he later corrected it because, as we see, the mm -hmm. State Department certainly is saying that, yes, we support the protesters and, and, uh, and want this. What is the goal of U.S. policy toward Iran? Is it regime change? Is it regime destabilization? Is it containment? Is it pushback? I don't know, you don't know, and the Iranians don't know, which means that we're not going to be able to, to uh, make progress, I think, out of this. I, I agree with Sina, I think that, and, and also with Alex, that the question is whether the hardliners will now make any concessions mm -hmm. to the U.S., and the question is in return for what? Mm -hmm. Will we see any concrete offer from the U.S.? If not, no. Uh, there will be no progress, and everybody is just going to hunker down. We will see more provocative actions by Iran, mm -hmm. certainly on the nuclear front. Mm -hmm. In January, they've promised another step out of the JCPOA, we're likely to see more, uh, possibly more aggressive actions mm -hmm. in the region, mm -hmm. although that mm -hmm. will depend on mm -hmm. 
whether the Saudis and the Emiratis are really willing to negotiate with Iran some yeah. sort of new understanding. And unfortunately for the Iranian people, we're going to see more and more harsher and harsher repression. I also agree with Alex. I think there was this idea that they would smoke out those who are really opposed to the government. And a lot of these protests took place in areas that are very restive because they have ethnic minorities there. Khuzestan province, ethnic Arab, Baluchistan, um, Sunnis. Uh, smoke these people out, throw them all in prison, and, and just try to get through the next year until the U.S. has elections again. Okay. If Alex, I may just uh, yeah, sure. add or build on some of the things Barbara just said, I mean, it, the irony here is one of the biggest fears in the Iranian opposition, if I could just bring them into the picture for a second, is yeah. how do you operate? What sort of policies do you argue for when you do, so you don't endanger the future of Iran as one country intact? This tells you quite a bit about how far the Islamic Republic's policies have brought the nation of Iran, this ancient country, to the brink where opposition members are worried about what an impoverished province like Balochistan, where, by the way, internet still has not been connected. Mm. Mm. Every Khuzestan and Balochistan still do not have internet over seven days later. This tells you that Tehran itself knows on the peripheries of the country that they have been in charge of for 40 years, there are these extreme deep pockets of resent resentment. And we can sit here and talk about the Trump administration all we want. But the reality is the first protest against the uh, regime of Ayatollah Khomeini began within weeks of him taking over in 1979. This is a home-created problem. The solution is not to be found in Washington. It's going to be found in Tehran. We can talk about maximum pressure all we want. But speaking of maximum pressure, one of the problems you have in the region, if you're sitting in Riyadh or Abu Dhabi, right now there is a massive trust deficit. Mm -hmm. They don't trust the Trump administration. This explains all sorts of rumors right now about how the Saudis, we just had Yusuf Alawi go to Tehran, most people in this town were speculating he might have had a message from the American side since he was in D.C. recently, but more likely had a message from the Saudis to the Iranians, and it probably is going to end up being something along the lines of what they can perhaps reach in terms of a deal about the future of Yemen, which would be something they can perhaps yeah. build on. But, you know, I again, something Barbara referred to, I don't believe, I don't get the sense... Um, sitting here thousand mile, thousands of miles away, I don't get the sense that the Iranian regime uh, will walk away from the JCPOA anytime soon. I expect, as Barbara pointed out, perhaps more, you know, the same kind of uh, gradual cutting down of their commitments to JCPOA, more coming in January, but I don't expect them to leave the deal. They are, as the Europeans are, in the business of buying time in the hope that perhaps there will be a new American president come November of, of next year. And remember, what happens if they walk away from the nuclear deal? So they've lost, actually, in fact, leverage. Even though they're not getting anything from the being in JC, JCPOA right now, they're not <clears> getting <throat> anything more by leaving it. In fact, you will say they'll lose leverage. They could do more, <clears throat> more. Uh, they could take more steps, such as leaving the uh, the nuclear non-proliferation treaty. If they do something like that, who's going to get equally upset? The Russians, the Chinese, which Iran likes to keep on its side. So, in other words, long story short, it's not that easy for the Iranians right now trying to get themselves into the uh, mm -hmm. from the position they're in. One thing they could do mm -hmm. is to bite the bullet and talk to the Trump administration as the offer from Washington is on the table. Now, this yesterday and today, Rouhani has been apparently reportedly asking for a quick visit to Tokyo, what the Japanese perhaps could do for him, but he wants to save face at the same time. So again, to Barbara's point, very concerned about having a photo opportunity and not get anything out in return. So what they're asking for the Iranians are continuing or re restarting talks with the Americans in the framework of P5 plus one. So now North Korean style bilateral talks, but in mm -hmm. the framework of P5 plus one, just so they have some insurance. Even if they don't get anything out of it, they can say, well, we're just acting, you know, in, 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 a, in a good manner, uh, in, in, uh, talking about how we can preserve this important international agreement. And if the Americans don't want to do their part, the rest of the world can see and judge them, if you will. 
Well, Alex, you raised a couple of very important things. I think the domestic dynamics, it's being so harsh and, and there's still no internet in some area. We've seen this story before in other places in the region. So my question, not don't answer now, but like mm -hmm. how how harsh, how widespread, how you know the violence can can increase to a level where it's not controllable anymore and then it's not about, you know, it gets much worse. One question is that. And then my question, you went to the region. Uh, my, my question was going to be on the region, but Sina wrote something with kind mm -hmm. of a provocative, maybe titled, you know, uh, editors tend to yeah, do I that. I, I don't know. <laughs> I figured, but uh, <laughs> so like you said, it says Iran is winning in the region uh, I, because of the US policy. So Barbara left it like, okay, everybody wants to play play to time in many ways until the next election. But I want to turn to just Sina and explain in what ways uh, this could be working for Iran in, in, in the region, uh, if it is at all. Right, right. Well, actually, that, yeah. uh, maybe you can, sure. you can explain that, sure. uh, that piece to us. Absolutely. Europe. So I think that in that article, um, it actually mm -hmm. touched on uh, Alex's point about after Iran's kind of escalation in the region mm -hmm. and uh, the attack on the tankers in the UAE port of Fujaira and then the attack on Saudi Aramco, mm -hmm. which Iran mm -hmm. says the Houthis did. Of course, others say that Iran, it came directly from Iran. Mm -hmm. You know, this really shattered the perception of a U.S. security umbrella for many of these kind of Arab Persian Gulf states, like the Saudis mm -hmm. and the UAE. And, you know, for them, they put all their eggs in the basket of Trump. And I think, you know, that they really hoped that you know if a war was going to erupt, the U.S. would pay the cost of that war and you know go to war against Iran. Like, but then after the drone downing last June, when that didn't happen, and then Iran mm -hmm. followed up with this, and Trump didn't follow up. You know, there's no cost for Iran basically for those attacks. That they they've been kind of fundamentally recalculating a lot of their security strategies, and we're seeing that you know over the past couple of months, yeah, the, the UAE has made kind of overtures to Iran. They've kind of release some frozen Iranian assets. They, re they reached this maritime agreement with Iran. And just like Alex said, the Saudis are similarly, it seems like, following up. And I think um, this raises a potential for a new security architecture in the region. I think really at the root of a lot of these regional crises right now are the dispute between Iran and Saudi Arabia. And that you know this has stoked a lot of instability. And I think it's a good time to revisit um, this idea of a collective kind of Persian Gulf security system mm. that includes Iran, Iraq, and the Persian Gulf states, and where they can have these institutionalized forums where they, they talk and they air their grievances and they kind of address a lot of their security dilemmas. And this is something that, you know, many people have called for. And Obama, you know, in his kind of foreign policy for the region, he stressed the need for kind of the U.S., Iran, the Saudis to reach a cold peace or kind of have an equilibrium. And ironically, it might be Donald Trump by showing the limits of U.S. support who's actually pushing the Saudis and the Emiratis to kind of perhaps pursue some sort of detente with Iran. But that was really the, the argument yeah. of the piece. But uh, based on what Alex and Barbara, but Alex mentioned that it was it could be a deal about Yemen. Maybe mm, it's, a, a, story, it's yeah. a specific thing. And then, you know, Barbara is saying it's such an inconsistent policy in the absence of a comprehensive policy to the region without the U.S. diplomatic sort of Heavy weight lifting, weight lifting. Can that happen? Do you see it realistic, or is, is it an aspirational goal, or you know it would see the foundations? Uh, it doesn't happen now, but it will lead there. Is that your theory? Or? I think yeah. I mean, Yemen, some kind of resolution in Yemen is a low hanging fruit for kind of Iran and Saudi Arabia, something mm -hmm. they can negotiate on. Iranian officials themselves, after like Imran Khan, the Pakistani prime minister acted as a mediator, and then there were mm -hmm. some other efforts. The Iranians themselves very openly said that their condition is some, some sort of settlement in Yemen or a ceasefire in Yemen. And we have seen that there have been these ceasefires. Mm -hmm. and the Emir Emiratis withdrew a lot of the troops, and the Saudis are seemingly trying to kind of resolve this conflict somehow, or at least reach these ceasefires. I mean, we'll see how it plays out, but I think Yemen would be a key critical stepping stone to kind of improving U Iranian Saudi mm -hmm. ties. Okay. Barbara, mm -hmm. um, based on, we've quickly raised a couple of issues. Mm -hmm. The regional sort of security architecture could actually be the uh, 
change in that um, architecture could be a byproduct of this inconsistent policy as you as you labeled it. Um, how do you see that? Uh, what, is that realistic to you? Mm. Or uh, if Trump gets reelected, where how do we proceed from there? What yeah. happens? Yeah, you know, President Rouhani at the UN announced this thing he called Hope, the Hormuz peace endeavor. Uh -huh. I don't think we're going to see a new regional security architecture uh, anytime soon. People have been talking about this forever, but I do think there will be understandings reached uh, quietly between the various key mm -hmm. actors in in the region. Um, and the Omanis obviously are very active. The Kuwaitis also mm -hmm. are, are seeking this. One of the first steps is for the GCC to get its own act together and hear the, the long fight between Saudi Arabia and Qatar mm -hmm. uh, appears to be mm -hmm. ebbing now. Um, I think the, the Qatari foreign minister was in Saudi Arabia. They're, um, uh, they're clearly going to, to tamp this down, and, and I think um, that's very, very important first. The GCC has to get its act together before it can really, uh, you know, mm -hmm. deal with Iran. Um, Yemen, hopefully, is a possibility. I, I see the U.S. as increasingly irrelevant, which is, which is, you know, is it good? Is it bad? I think it would be better if there was U.S. support for this process of, of regional uh, reconciliation. Uh, but, but there is no U.S. leadership for it. Um, the U.S. has had a very inconsistent policy, certainly towards Syria, mm -hmm. you know, troops there, troops not there. Um, in Iraq, um, you know, Iranian influence has been very heavily challenged in these recent protests, mm -hmm. but it's not as though people are in favor of more U.S. intervention. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think the same thing is true in Lebanon. Um, Iran's position is, is mixed. Uh, yes, it has intimidated the Saudis and the Emiratis very effectively with its actions over the summer. Um, but these protests uh, by Shia populations, remember, a majority, I mean, most of these protests in Iraq are coming from the Shia South. Mm -hmm. They're yeah. coming from places like Basra. They're coming from Sadr City. Uh, in Lebanon, it's mixed. It's, it's all, uh, all sex. I think these are primarily generational protests younger generations that are fed up with corruption, fed up with the lack of services and the lack of jobs, and that simply resent the established political order mm -hmm. in all of these places. And of course, Iran, because it, it's entrenched in, in these places, is, is, uh, is one of the objects of the protests. And I think there was an impact, in a way, uh, on Iran itself, where young people who feel hopeless mm -hmm. are willing to go out and risk their lives uh, because of their anger over the lack of benefits that they're receiving from, from the system. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a really interesting time. I mean, I'm looking, and um, you know, Sina and, and Alex may know more, but I'm looking to see how, how the Iranian system deals with, with the challenges that it's facing. Repression alone is not going to work. Mm -hmm. They're going to have to offer some sort of new vision, um, whether it's from the hardliners this time as opposed to the so-called reformists or so-called right. moderates, that will get people to engage in things like parliamentary elections, which are coming up in, in February. Who will vote in this atmosphere? Uh, will there be new faces? Um, is there any, any way to get the population to re-engage, or are we just simply going to see an increasing alienation of ordinary people from a system, you know, which frankly has never been very popular, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. not, not since the day after the, the revolution. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm going to be looking for, for this. Um, I have um, perhaps more confidence maybe is the wrong word, but I think the Iranian system may be able to deal with this in ways that we can't yet envision. And I I totally doubt the ability of the United States to play in this arena. I think everything the U.S. has done has been ham-handed, clumsy, uh, and uh, has just shown a lack of understanding of the complexity of, mm -hmm. of a country like Iran. Mm -hmm. Alex, Barbara just talked about er what I asked earlier about domestic dimensions, but please feel free sure. to comment on the region. No, I mean, as well. again, uh, uh, I'll go back to both uh, Sina and Barbara, but let me just, uh, on the last point about the U.S. policy, is it there, is it not there? One thing I think that the administration, and I'm certainly not going to critique 
uh, I can critique it, but I'm not going to advocate for or against maximum pressure. But I can say, in my view, they can do a better job in terms of managing expectations. Uh, sure. If you are an Iranian activist in Iran or outside of Iran, and don't forget, there's a very big role that the Iranian diaspora, which is anywhere between five, six, seven million strong, are playing in this. So we pay a lot of attention to Iranians inside Iran. There's a huge diaspora involvement in this, and uh, their voices need to be heard. Uh, but if you were one of those activists and you were trying to figure out how much the U.S. is paying attention to what's happening in Iran, uh, I mean, it, it at times appeared, uh, might have seemed like nothing was going on in Iran. U.S. media weren't covering the protest in Iran. You, you, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't giving anybody an impression Iran is a key foreign policy issue in Washington because it wasn't being covered that way in U.S. media. The Europeans, the same week as the protests are pretty much uh, wrapping up, introduced the expansion of the so-called instex, again, creating this impression in the, in the Iranian opposition community that actually the U.S. and Europe really don't want to see regime change for whatever reason. If anything, the only thing they're interested in is a weakened Islamic Republic. This is something you will hear, and I think a lot of Arab states will probably have people subscribe to that theory. Speaking of Arab states, uh, the issue of hope came up, the Hormuz peace endeavor, which, as Barbara said, was uh, introduced by President Rouhani in, in, at the UN in September. Again, as Barbara said, we've seen many such initiatives before. Uh, initiatives before They come and go. There's always one problem with them. The Iranians insist all extra regional states need to leave the region. Primarily, this means the United States. Now, if you're sitting in one of those uh, smaller, financially very wealthy, but, you know, insecure, when you look to your north, you see giant neighbors like Pakistan, Iran, Iraq, and you have reason to be insecure. This is a, a deal breaker. The idea that you insist before anything is done, the United States needs to leave. That means, in practical terms, close the bases in Kuwait, in Qatar, in UAE, in Saudi That's Arabia. Okay. That's a non-starter. This time around, to give Rouhani some credit, and what I've seen come out of Tehran says, that insistence isn't that strong anymore. That might be a recognition that the Iranians will accept that at least in the interim, till you have enough confidence, our neighbors to the south want the United States military presence to continue while we discuss the future of some kind of a security architecture. If, if that's the way forward, you might see more progress being done uh, than we've seen previously. But another point I make about Iran in the region, because everybody was sort of so surprised about, uh, about the capacity of the Iranians to hit uh, Abqaiq and Khoreis in Saudi Arabia. I and mean, nobody expected that sort of position, uh, military operation, and they did it. And, you know, it started in May, as we know, in the Gulf of Oman with the ships and then so forth. So, yes, Iran has a capacity to hit its, uh, its enemies. But there is a red line somewhere out there that I don't know what it is. Mm -hmm. The Iranians presumably don't know what that red, red line is. And I don't think the United States has put that red line down, or maybe it has. But it, is Iran in a position to tempt fate, if you will, to figure out, mm, when is it too late? When have I crossed that red line? So I think that in itself, and that sort of second-guessing yourself, going forward will make the Iranians think twice about uh, you know, what they're doing in the region. And look, speaking of the region, if anybody clever in Tehran wants to have a, have a look at what they're doing, the Iranian consulate in Najaf was burned for the third time in, in a week. Najaf, of all places. If you're not welcome, you're not welcome. Now, I'm not saying Iran doesn't have interest in neighboring states. Iran has 15 neighboring states, as any state has to have the right to defend itself, to have relations with, it, with its neighbors. But having relations with neighbors, having... Um, the ability to trade commerce and all the rest of it that comes with international relations is not the same as Qasem Soleimani getting on a helicopter and landing in the, in the green zone when there's an internal crisis in Iraq. That's interference. Mm -hmm. Nobody would want to see Iraqis come to Iran and do that in Tehran. So I think this whole idea of forward defense, we have to go to the Arab world. To defend Iran, we have to be in Lebanon. We have to be in Syria. This whole thing right now, it's been tested severely. Mm -hmm. And I hope they're going to re revisit this and go back and rebuild Iran because that's what the Iranian mm -hmm. people want from their government. Thanks for going to the questions I was going <laughs> to ask. Iraq was the other question that I wanted to ask you. Maybe you can talk about it later if you feel like it. 
uh, a bit more. So, uh, Sina, you talked about uh, the the different factions within within Iran struggling over this, the protests, how to respond, and coming after Rouhani, etc. Uh, and we, you know, we've heard comments about uh, whether you can actually maybe make the deal with hardliners because you know moderates are weakened and they were never able to deliver it for for a variety of reasons let's say um where how does that dynamic evolve like i think alex is saying they may have softened their regional you know uh us has to leave approach because they they are weakened at home as, as well so hardliners maybe getting you know stronger relative to moderates but Overall, they may be weakened. Uh, so how do you see that playing out, especially if there's more protests and more violence? I mean, nobody wishes that, but how does that actually delegitimize their position or weaken their position, and then that reflects on the regional and the, you know, the relations with the US as well? Right, great question. I think, um, importantly, there's, you know, there's still a strong domestic debate on Iran on all of these issues. It's not like it's suddenly a monolithic system. There's still a lot of debate on mm -hmm. all these issues amongst all these different factions. And interestingly, before the uh, the gas price hike and the week before the gas price hike, Rouhani gave a couple of important statements. One was that he said that the Prophet Muhammad, even after he had made a deal with some enemy and that enemy reneged on that deal, mm -hmm. he still kind of engaged them. Mm -hmm. And then he also said that um, he can't manage this economy with the current sanctions and everything. So to me, this is, you know, this is kind of pressuring and kind of Khamenei most likely to um, agree to perhaps lower the threshold for negotiations with Trump. You know, Khamenei said that all sanctions have to be removed. And there's been this idea of the Macron offer and this overall idea of a kind of a ceasefire where mm -hmm. Iran ceases the nuclear esca escalation, the U.S. kind of reissues some of these oil waivers. And I think so maybe, and you know, again, they, all these different factions in Iran knew that the gas price hike would lead to protests. So perhaps Rouhani saying these statements before, maybe he hoped actually that some of these protests would push Khamenei to maybe lower his threshold. And then maybe, you know, Raisi and these hardliners had, you know, their own goals with these protests perhaps. Mm. But I think, um, so yeah, I mean, we'll have to see what goes forward. But the, I mean, the important point is that there's still a debate on all these issues in Iran and it's not like, you know, it's just the hardliners are totally in charge right now. Although they have their ascendant right now and, you know, their positions right now are the dominant one and Iran is, is not negotiating. But I think, you know, there's these different efforts being made and could, that continue to be made. And I think if Trump were sincere in seeking a deal with Iran, you know, I think maximum pressure has played out. It hasn't led to Iran changing its foreign policies. It hasn't collapsed the regime. It's led to this more aggressive behavior by Iran. If Trump is sincere in wanting a behavior, he has to, it's the, you know, he should shift away from maximum pressure, offer the sanctions relief, and he can perhaps get this kind of meeting with Rouhani and some of these. Yeah. With did, you, did you get a sense among the protesters, among common sort of people on the street, was there any aspect of we do need to, you know, engage with the U.S. negotiations? Was there any of that? Uh, do they yeah. see that as part of their plight? Um, so these protests were, you know, primarily with economic grievances, obviously, that yeah, triggered them. Yeah. People who were desperate that led to broader, you know, slogans yeah. and grievances against the whole yeah, political yeah. system. And um, I think that Iranian people, by and large, within the society, they've given up hope on negotiations with the U.S., the West, the JCPOA. Mm -hmm. These aren't really even pertinent discussions okay. domestically as much anymore. You know, when the JCPOA was being negotiated, when, you know, and Rouhani was elected in 2013 and 2017 by wide margins with a high mm -hmm. participation rate, this was on a platform on engagement with the West, which the Iranian public has always wanted more diplomatic engagement with the mm -hmm. West. They were kind of, you know, the public, you know, they don't, they didn't want, you know, they, they rejected these kind of confrontational policies of Ahmadinejad. And unfortunately, the U.S., you know, they, with the maximum pressure, they, they did the biggest blow to that. That's why mm -hmm. I think, you know, in terms of long-term U.S.-Iran relations, this bodes very poorly for kind of the prospect for new negotiations and kind of public support for them. Can, can yeah. I just, one Please, thing, I mean, I Barbara. remember in 2009 after the, the, the rigged presidential elections, one of the chants of people in the street was to Obama, are you with us or are you with mm. regime, right? Playing off his name, Obama. 
Yeah. Um, okay. I don't yeah. think there's been any chance, Trump, are you with us? I mean, I don't think anybody in Iran puts any faith in him mm -hmm. to deliver anything um, to them. So, um, you know, the question really is for the, the Iranian uh, elite mm. to figure out, you know, are they going to put all their eggs in the China, Russia, India, Turkey basket? Are they going to give up on the Europeans? Are they going to stay mm. in the JCPOA? And it is important to note that what, a half dozen more European countries have joined this thing called INSTEX, which is a mechanism for non-dollar mm -hmm. trade with Iran, initially humanitarian goods. Uh, and the first transaction is supposed to go through by the end of this week mm -hmm. because there's going to be a meeting in Vienna of the Joint Commission, which was set up under the JCPOA to deal with implementation of the agreement, deal with disputes. Um, one fruit of maximum pressure, ironically, is that it may finally force Europe into coming up with ways to get around the US financial system, which is perhaps not what the architects of maximum pressure mm -hmm. had in mind. I found it very ironic this morning that um, certain individuals who had uh, lobbied very, very hard for maximum pressure are now complaining about INSTEX and demanding that the Iranian counterpart to INSTEX be sanctioned. Uh, I think sanctions are, are, I think they're, you know, as a tactic, they are, they are becoming counterproductive. They're running out of things to sanction. Mm -hmm. You know, now they're going to sanction, they're going to comb videos of the protests and try to identify individual Iranian policemen and members of the IRGC and the besiege so they can individually sanction, you know, Ali from, from Mashhad. I mean, how is this going to be a useful use of this mm -hmm. tactic? These are people who have nothing, no, no assets in the United States and never contemplated coming here. Uh, but that's where we are with yeah. it. It's kind of reached a level of absurdity. But uh, Barbara, so we, we I just realized our panel identified two, let's say, byproduct or unintended consequence of maximum pressure. One is regional, regional powers have to figure out a way to work with each other at least you know, because they don't trust the U.S. anymore. And then the other thing you just pointed out, yeah. Europeans have to find creative ways and to It's not just Europe, mind you. The Russians yes. and the Chinese have also, yes. and Turks, I believe, mm -hmm. and Indians, they're all trading in local currencies with yeah. Iran to but, get around sanctions. But obviously it's not, you know, enough for the economy to, no. to be humming or anything like that. So it's some sort of deal with the U.S. Uh, I feel like it's a, it's a must, but like... But my question is, Trump's threshold for, for a deal is relatively low. I, like, when you look at his North Korea and China policies, right, mm -hmm. I think if he can sell it domestically, here's, I got a deal one way or another, I think the content won't matter all that much. Mm -hmm. So do you, do you feel like, you know, if he gets reelected and next year, Going forward, I mean, isn't that another unintended consequence or byproduct of maximum pressure? Okay, I've pressed them enough. Now they've caved, even though they may not. He can sell something like that. And You know, I question his ability to negotiate. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, remember, the JCPOA took 12 years and, and mm -hmm. you know, went through many iterations. Um, but is that's there what I'm saying. Does is it there have a to be comprehensive? Is there a like capacity for that? Um, you know, uh, the Iranians have said they'll change the name of the JCPOA. They'll call it the Trump Comprehensive Plan of Action. <laughs> you know, if he'll if he'll come back and if the U.S. will come back into compliance with it, would the Iranians be willing to to grant some further concessions? Possibly, um, but uh, as I say, we're still waiting mm -hmm. for the price of admission, namely some sort of sanctions relief. Um, for the Iranians, I think you know, in a way, this is the time because Trump is weak now. If he's reelected, um, he's actually in a stronger position. So if anything is going to happen, it probably has to be in the next few months. But then mm. I asked the question of whether his domestic base would support it. Mm. Uh, with a, a North Korea deal or a China trade, you know, these things have, would have a lot of support domestically. But would an Iran deal have domestic mm. support mm. among his base, evangelical Christians and supporters of Bibi Netanyahu? I don't think so. That's why I kind of doubt that we're going to get to that. Okay. Alex. You know, I, I, I just wanted to add, um, <laughs> there are folks in Tehran who are looking at the eight-year-old Supreme Leader Ayatollah Ali Khamenei 
and saying to themselves, we have to maneuver, we have to position ourselves in a way that we benefit when, once he leaves the political scene. In other words, there are people who will feel that perhaps as part of being ready for the next stage to come after Khamenei, anti-Americanism has to continue. So yes, there are, you know, we're talking about could hardliners provide concessions? Maybe. I mean, we have the May of 2018 12 points by Secretary of State Pompeo. But in fact, in this last summer, at the end of G7, uh, President Trump reduced that to basically three. Longer duration for an agreement, no nuclear weapons, and, uh, and missiles. And hostages was probably added as a fourth. And missiles. Now, the Iranians have issued a fatwa, no nuclear weapons. So that, that's, that's easy. That's already done. Longer duration, that kind of goes hand in hand. If they don't want a nuclear weapon, so what, why would he object to 100 years duration for this agreement? And missiles, presumably, I assume, that's something you can, you can negotiate. Iran has security threats. They don't really have much of an air force. Their missiles are basically part of their deterrence. You can discuss the range of the missiles. In other words, a solution along those lines can be found. But the problem of U.S.-Iran is much deeper than that. So you will solve it for a, for a brief period of time, and it doesn't matter if it's Trump or a Democrat taking over in the White House. And it requires somebody in Tehran to say, we need to turn a page. I don't know if the audience here remember the guy who died uh, two years ago, Ayatollah Rafsanjani. Mm. He was a kingmaker in Iran when Khomeini was around in the 1980s. And before Khomeini died in 1989, he turned around, if you can see it in his memoirs, he says, there are a couple of things we needed Khomeini to do before he died. One was to end the Iran-Iraq war. Because if he died and we hadn't ended the war, this war could go on forever. He had, another thing he had to do while he was alive was to turn the page in relations with the United States. Before, he can do it. He's the one who started it. He's, he's got the authority to do it. Now, do we really think Khomeini wants to be the person who says, actually, the last 40 years of enmity with the United States and the ideological position we've created for ourselves on this issue, let's just throw it out of our way. It's not going to happen. He's, he doesn't want to fix, fix that issue while he's alive, which I think is the elephant in the room. You have not enough consensus in Tehran for a real deal, something that's sustainable, something that the nation of Iran wants and be, would immensely benefit from. Nobody can probably calculate the billions of dollars Iran has had to pay in terms of cost because of this U.S.-Iran situation for the last 40 years. Mm. So, yeah, look, Rouhani might go to Tokyo tomorrow or go to Oman, some kind. But, you know, a, a longer-term solution to the U.S.-Iran crisis, first and foremost, requires a change in Tehran in terms of accepting the fact and, you know, you don't have to go back and say hostage crisis was a mistake. You don't have to go that far back. But you have to accept if you can have relations with Russia or China, why can't you have relations with the United States? Why are you so sure that Mr. Putin or President Xi do want to do so much wonderful things for Iran, whereas the Americans don't? Everybody's looking after number one, including the Russians, the Chinese, and the Americans. But let's just bring the Americans in and maximize the benefits. I think that's what... Those young protesters, they might not shout foreign policy, policy slogans, but if you listen to the chatter that's coming out of social media, there is inherent fear about Iran becoming a forgotten black hole, a North Korea of sorts. Mm. They don't want to live that life. Mm. And you cannot be a normal state and continue having this kind of approach towards the United States. Not, you don't not, see a yeah. pro prospect for convincing how many of this? Khamenei will not, uh, you no, know, no, he will, he will do the tactical. He'll do what it takes for him. He wants to basically, the expression as I believe, have his cake and eat it too type of thing. Look, when President Trump, in, in, in defense of the Trump administration, when they came in, they did something that I thought was extremely uh, ill-considered, the travel ban, the first week. Made no sense to me whatsoever. But they did not walk away from the nuclear deal in the first week. It took them over a year. And in that year, they were saying to the Iranians, what can you do for us in the region? What can we talk about? And Iran was playing hardball. They didn't give much back. And that's why the administration decided, OK, we're going to walk away then. So um, you know, to the point yeah. I made, a long-term, durable solution 
requires a deeper soul searching and admission. It requires political guts mm -hmm. to say by the likes of Ayatollah Khamenei, okay, we, and that's, I can't, as I said, yeah. while he's alive, I can't see him do that. Very one shortly, important, if I can just, yeah. if I just say one important thing, I think, great points, I agree with most of what you said, but I think on the issue of US-Iran distrust, one thing we can't lose sight of is that it was the US that reneged on the JCPOA and left the JCPOA, not Iran not Khamenei, Iran was fully abiding by its commitments. Absolutely. And the hope of the JCPOA was that it could be a stepping stone towards revamped relations with the US. And Khamenei himself in 2015 gave this important speech where he said the JCPOA would be an experience to see a test, if, a test where if we could trust and we can negotiate on other stuff. And in the past, I mean, I do agree with you that Khamenei is largely opposed to improving relations, but I wouldn't say fundamentally so. I mean, there's, you know, the track record is, of you know, Afghanistan in 2001, a lot of overtures in the 90s, even during Ahmadinejad. But I think you know, one key element of this is that many in the US, many in the region who have a lot of influence over US mm -hmm. policy, they also do not want US-Iran relations to improve. They view they're fundamentally opposed to US-Iran diplomacy. And John Bolton or Mike Pompeo, these are figures who, they're actually not looking for a better deal or better. They just they want regime change. They're fundamentally opposed to U.S. Iran diplomacy in principle, and they, they've openly wanted war, both Pompeo and Bolton. So I think this is also a very important part of this story that we can't lose sight of. And I think for U.S. Iran relations to improve, you know, there's, I mean, ironically, See, the hardliners on both sides empower each other yeah. and kind of feed off each other. Just yeah. maybe, perhaps in Alex's defense, the the kind of deep soul searching he was talking about didn't happen here either, right? So when the JCPOA passed, it was mostly Obama. The Congress Wisconsin. didn't didn't you know it wasn't a treaty. So and it was limited, right? So it was quite vulnerable. Yes, U.S. and U.S. was able to walk away from it because of that. Perhaps what Alex was describing about about Iran is is also true here. Like, do does the U.S. really want to? have that kind of long-term sustainable. Um, so uh, stopping the blame game here, I want to turn to the audience if I can. If anybody has questions, please. <clears throat> and Alex, my Iraq question still <laughs> remains, or the regional outreach of Iran. Please, thank you. Hey, uh, Marina Ottawa with the Wilson Center. Uh, I'd like to take you back to the players who have been totally absent from the discussion, that is the protesters, yes. for a moment. And, my, and I want to put this in a regional context, because we are seeing these protests that sort of the second wave of uprisings that, uh, you know, across the region. And one thing which strikes me about uh, what's happening in some of the other countries, not so much in Lebanon, but it may certainly in uh, Sudan and Algeria, and I think it's beginning in Iraq, mm -hmm. that the protesters are becoming much more organized in a sense of having some sort of a strategy of what they want to accomplish. It's not uh, just the gas prices, it's not mm -hmm. just, but in how they can organize, how can they act so as to have a long-term influence over the regime. Do you see anything like that happening in uh, Iran now, or has the regime intervened too quickly and uh, you know used violence and suppressed uh, whatever change might uh, be uh, arising from within the ranks of the mm -hmm. protesters? Thank you. Yeah, I, I personally don't see it. I mean, I think the regime cracked down much too fast, mm -hmm. um, and the let's let's you know the Iranian government has been very good at identifying potential leaders. Uh, and putting them in prison since long ago. So if you're, if you're a leader in the women's rights movement, if you're a, a labor activist, I mean, you've been in Evan prison already for years. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I, don't, I don't see, also in the diaspora, frankly, I think the diaspora is very opportunistic. Whenever there are protests in Iran, they jump on them and try to identify themselves with it. But, you know, what is their real organic connection to these people? Uh, I don't know. Um, whereas in Lebanon and Iraq, I think it's it's very different. Um, also, I mean, the government, those two governments have, uh, although Iraq has been very, very bloody, bloodier even mm. than, than Iran, they haven't cut the internet, they haven't prevented people from communicating with each other, which was another way that the 
regime in Iran really nip this um, nip this in the bud. I don't know if you yeah. agree. Alex. No, I, I agree largely with, with Barbara. I haven't seen any, I mean, you know, in 2009, you might demand. have, you might had, slogans for, you know, in support of the Mir Hossein and Musavis and the Mehdi Karubis of this world and the idea that reform should be given a chance. Nobody talks about reform anymore. It didn't happen, by the way, late 2017, 2018. And I think I started off my remarks by saying, in the eyes of most in Iran today, reformism is just a ploy by the regime. Right now, the Iranian parliament has a reformist majority of 120. Mm -hmm. out of 290, and it's been in place almost four years. Anybody in this room or anywhere tell me what they've done, the so-called reformist majority. People have been doing this for so long that they, you know, generation after generation. And Ayatollah Khamenei came out just a few days ago. He wants more excitement for the upcoming majlis elections. <laughs> he wants a, a, elections <laughs> and excitement around him for, for the projection of legitimacy around the world. But people inside Iran don't buy it anymore. These elections don't matter. The Majlis voted three times against the price increase for the gasoline. Yeah. And they said, forget you. The, the boss at the top has already okayed it. Mm -hmm. I mean, in terms of uh, uh, the opposition outside, I've seen, I, as I said, I didn't see any names uh, of folks inside Iran. I don't know where Mehdi Kalari, by the way, is on the issue of the upcoming elections. I think I have heard Mayor Hossein Musavi call for boycott, uh, or at least saying, you know, how dare you talk about elections when this is what you do to our young men, shooting them in the head. Karubi, there are some conflicting reports about what his wife came out and read a statement from him saying, let's have, you know, good elections coming up. I think most people who supported uh, the, the sort of green movement 10 years ago have given up on the idea that you can bring about change through the ballot box in Iran. Reza Pahlavi was one figure I saw a lot of, certainly in terms of the social media. Um, you know, we can, we can discuss Reza Pahlavi, uh, what he stands for. I certainly think one of some of the things I've heard him say in terms of going forward as a transition leader, as preparing Iran for something, um, that looks like a modern state away from the theocracy of the, of, the, of the last four decades, deserves to be given a chance, deserves to be given a chance. There is no Ayatollah Khomeini. There is no one leader today that people can rally around. And you know what? That's a good thing. Because they rallied, rallied, rallied around Ayatollah Khomeini, 99% of those people who rallied around him had no idea what the man stood for. You can quiz, ask Reza Pahlavi, what do you stand for? What's your program? Now, again, I'm not advocating for, for regime change. That's not my place. That's not what I do. But you asked the question of, are there figures? There are many people who, who have uh, hope that um, the son of the late Shah is that hope. I'd love to hear, uh, leave that to my fellow panelists, but that's certainly how I see it. It's Zina. interesting. One thing I would, I mean, there's a lot of things to note about that, but one thing I would note is that um, I've heard the most slogans in these, sporad, you know, these protests this year and in 2017, 2018, which, you know, geographically a wide area, mm -hmm. the magnitude was, wasn't as the same as like the Green Movement where 3 million people are out in the streets of Tehran after Musabi called for them. You know, it's like hundreds of people or thousands of people. But I think, you know, one thing that stands out to me is that I haven't actually heard very few slogans in favor of Reza Pahlavi, the son of the Shah, but a lot of slogans about um, Reza Khan, Reza Shah, Reza who, Shah yeah, who the ruled grandfather. in the 30s and 40s. Yeah. And I think to me, this is worrisome in a couple ways because it <laughs> indicates that, you know, Reza Shah, he's, he's widely revered by many Iranians. And it's because, you know, he built the first centralized Iranian state and a lot of the initial infrastructure in Iran in the early 20th century. And, but he was really a brute dictator that did it by force. And, you know, the perception of a brute dictator as opposed to a system that has politics is that there is no corruption, there is no nothing. We have this one leader who like gets everything done. Whereas a system that has any form of politics, you're gonna have, a lot of kind of tensions mm -hmm. and issues. And I think, to me, this indicates that there's an openness for many within Iran, not necessarily for Reza Pahlavi, but for this idea of a Reza Shah, this kind of, this dictatorial more figure who comes in and, you know, he's the guy who runs the show and, you know, there is no corruption. And this can actually, I think, you know, it's hard to see what the alternative to the Islamic Republic is, unfortunately, given all the repression, given everything. And mm. I think, you know, the, or, the most organized uh, entity in Iran is ultimately the Revolutionary Guards. And I think in the event of some kind of collapse or something, they're well positioned to really consolidate power and maybe 
who knows, some Qasem Soleimani type figure, if not him, is the new Reza Shah. I don't know, this is, yeah. a, this is a concern I, I personally Don't you yeah. feel like that could be a sort of people wanting some sort of semblance of stability and that, that instead of, as opposed to previous protests where you had more sort of, it was more about political rights, now because of the economic, you know, mm. uh, uh, you know, grievance here, it's much more about economic sort of grievances obviously and then ask for a stability yeah. and this idealized time where there was stability. I think so, so absolutely. So it's less about political rights uh, and more about that and you know perhaps it's not about the individuals but but wouldn't that create like doesn't that make the protesters um, aren't they coming from a broader than than socioeconomic background as opposed to other previous protests? Is that I think one seeing, thing that or? stood out, like the Green Movement was really, you know, it was a liberal movement. Mm -hmm. And it remark, to me, it really indicated the evolution of Iranian society over the past century towards kind of liberal democratic norms. And mm -hmm. really, you know, at the, fun, at the grassroots level, kind of civil society and kind of the discussions. And, you know, Iran, ironically, I think Iranian civil society and reading a lot of people in Iran, these former, dis, you know, these dissidents who were in prison or out, they're active on social media. And kind of the debates they have and the level of sophistication and the level of, on, on a lot of, you know, so-called classical liberal values, kind of engaging your opponents, kind of minority yeah. rights. A lot of the debate there has gotten a lot more amongst these group of people, a lot more sophisticated. Whereas in the diaspora, if anything, a lot of the kind of, I would characterize them as fringe opposition with the monarchist movement and the MEK, this cult group that they are more dogmatic and ideological and illiberal than ever. And very much like their supporters on social media and they're elsewhere, horrible. that's any indication of where they want to take you on. They're vicious and they've alienated so many people. And I think if anything, they're boosting the reformists in Iran mm -hmm. because most Iranians see this rhetoric and they're scared like, oh, if these guys aren't coming in charge. They're worse and you know, they're just as bad as these people. So if anything, they're discrediting themselves. And yeah, there's a social media presence, but I think, honestly, I think there's a lot of evidence to suggest this has manipulated this discourse. I just wanted to say a word about Reza Pahlavi. When there were big protests in end of 20, 2017, beginning of 2018, he started making the rounds of a couple of think tanks around town. You know, he's a very pleasant 58, 59-year-old man who's lived in Potomac, Maryland for the last 40 years. Um, he is not charismatic. He's not a great speaker. Um, his ideas are sort of obvious, um, but you know, I, I was at one off-record thing with him where people were complaining that he has three daughters, and the complaint was, well, he has to have a son or he can't go back to Iran because we have to know who's coming after him. I mean, I don't think people in Iran, maybe they want a Reza Shah, I don't know, but you know, the idea of restoring this monarchy, I think, is just a pipe dream, and he is not the mm -hmm. figure to do it. He is just not... He's not charismatic. He's not ruthless. He's he pops up mm -hmm. when when appropriate right. and says the right things, but he's not the leader mm -hmm. of of anything. I mean, if if you know if I were an Iranian, I would look to the population of Evan Prison. There are a lot of good people in that prison right now who could mm -hmm. who could run the country. People like Nasrin Satuda and many others, lawyers, human rights activists, civil society activists, who have been thrown in prison over the years. Um, and, and, you know, the change will have to come from within. It has to be homegrown. Uh, and, and, you know, we should be doing everything we can to, to <laughs> encourage it from within, uh, not trying to produce uh, solutions from the outside. I mean, I, I, I don't want to get in defending individuals. Again, as I said before, it's not my job. But I do think Reza Pahlavi has a lot to offer in terms of the ideas I've heard him say. You can agree or disagree with it, but I think he certainly has captivated uh, a, a good part of the Iranian diaspora because uh, the Iranian diaspora does matter. In terms of, I mean, Barbara, in an ideal world, you want to see someone come out of Evin prison and yeah. take over, yeah. but that's not going to happen mm -hmm. because Ayatollah Khamenei is not going to let that happen. He's not going to be there forever. Well, and Ayatollah <laughs> Khomeini lived outside Iran from 1964 till he took over Iran in 1979. Are you suggesting that Reza Pahlavi is no, anything like Ayatollah Khomeini? No, I'm saying Khomeini? prisons where you're sitting in Potomac or you're sitting in Evino, it, it's about the power of your ideas.
That's what yeah. it's about. It's not. He has a claim. He is a son of Iran. They're sons and daughters of Iran. They have claims. Everybody. And by the way, I am no fan of MEK, and I say that publicly, and I probably get attacked for it. But they have to be part of the conversation. Because if you want to live in a democratic Iran, everybody has to be part of the conversation. The Kurds, the Baluch, the Khuzestani Arabs, every group that's aggrieved has to be part of the conversation. And I mean, that's where we ought to be going. And right now, I agree with, uh, with Sina and, and Barbara. Yes, the opposition is, is fragmented, but that doesn't mean it has to be fragmented forever. Because they have no. one thing in common. Do you common. know, Reza Pahlavi said publicly that he would not work with the NEK because they are anti-democratic. I mean, when you look at the, the panoply of groups, they don't work together. Right. They, don't, they don't come together. The ethnic groups, Reza Pahlavi and so on. I mean, where is the sort of manifesto of the Iranian opposition? But this is Iranian not an Iranian opposition? problem. This is a problem you find across diaspora politics. Look at the Hungarians, yeah, look at the yeah. Cubans, look at the Indians. This, yeah. is, this is found across communities. But I'll say one thing, because Revolutionary Guards is often mentioned. I'm not saying Sina suggested Revolutionary Guards as the sort of saviors. I, I don't think that he used the word savior, but I think you hinted that it's a potential, yeah, you know, the most to, to take over. Because they're organizing, arrested. Yeah. I totally agree. The problem they would have is they are at the heart of one problem that gets people so upset, corruption. Mm -hmm. They are, these people were known in the 1980s as the ones who sacrificed their lives going yeah, facing Saddam's army. Today, they're known for one thing, picking up your sons and daughters and corruption. We're talking about today uh, the latest protests that were uh, started because of the gas price increase. I was reading the other day, the Iranian state media were saying one good reason why we stop or we increase the price of gas is because so much of it was being smuggled out daily to neighboring countries. <laughs> mm. Now, who is in charge of Iran's international borders? <laughs> the Revolutionary Guards. So how come they can't control the borders when they can be such great heroes for the Iraqis, mm -hmm. for the Syrians, for the Lebanese? They are part of the corruption problem, and therefore, I think that's going to be their political handicap going forward. Mm -hmm. Even though I agree, they are the most organized, and they are proving themselves to be pretty ruthless mm -hmm. and willing to do whatever to stay in power. But can they pull it off in the long term? I don't know. Thank you. Do we have more questions in the audience? So, um, yeah. yes, go ahead. A short question. My name is Hassan, uh, working here as a researcher. Uh, I'd like to ask whether you, you've seen any change after uh, John Bolton uh, resigned uh, slash fired. <laughs> Barbara, that's really for you. Uh, <laughs> I'm waiting for Pompeo to leave. Then maybe, maybe we'll see a little more flexibility because, I mean, John Bolton was a great advocate of bombing Iran. That was always his solution. And he, of course, is in the pay of the NEK. So not ever an objective figure. Um, but Pompeo has been just as hard line in terms of uh, his demands. And I mean, the State Department puts out a weekly, you know, this week in, in how we heard Iran policy statement, right? Mm. Um, they don't do that for any other country. So this ideological, uh, uh, you know, uh, anti-Iran attitude is very much emanating from, from the State Department. Um, perhaps if he leaves too, we might, you know, might get somewhere. And I would just add on that, that, you know, Trump, I think he's really been misled on the efficacy of maximum pressure by these advisors. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Trump thought this can get him a deal, but it really got him to the cusp of war with Iran, which he doesn't want. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, he doesn't really understand the strategies involved here and kind of the geopolitics. But I think if these people do transition out and Pompeo goes as well, that, you know, Trump himself, and if he's really in charge, maybe that does improve the prospects for a deal. Alex, any comments? No, I mean, look, uh, I, I certainly uh, have never seen any value in arguing for bombing Iran. Uh, it, it, you know, it goes without saying. Um, but I just want to go back to, to a point I think it's so important to remember. How did this fight, fight start? If you really want to find the roots for this fight, November of 1979, taking over the embassy, and we can sit here and talk about what happened in '53 and all the other things the U.S. might have done that was wrong um, against Iran when the Shah was in power. But in November of 79, one group of supporters of Iran Ayatollah Khomeini decided to take the embassy to score political points on the domestic front, to sideline the leftists, to take one issue, anti-Americanism, away from the left, make it their own, and they didn't really think about the long-term consequences. And here, 
40 years later, we're sitting here trying debating what, what happened. You know, Khamenei and Rafsanjani were in Mecca. They had no idea what was about to happen. It wasn't exactly thought through. And, you know, sometimes it's, I guess, good to be determined, if not stubborn. But sometimes it might be a bit, not a bad idea to sort of yeah. say, look, this now has run yeah, its course. But how do they do that at a time when the United States is imposing maximum pressure without totally losing look, face? You know, it's, if they couldn't do it when Obama was president, how can they do it now with Trump? I'm not saying the U.S. is going into that room without uh, demands, of course. And some of these are tough demands. I mean, I think the toughest one we haven't talked about is, and, and I'm sure that will always be part of the U.S. list of concessions from Tehran, is, for, for example, its position on the Arab-Israeli peace process. Yes, absolutely. You know, things what like that. Process, they, our but, peace yeah. process, whatever's left of it. There are some tough challenges, but it goes back to two things. What does Iran want to be? I don't, I don't want to use the cliche, but really, it, it does tell us a lot. A nation state, a cause. Right now, Iran acts more like a cause. Right, mm -hmm. it really mm -hmm. does. Mm -hmm. it, it, it wants to spread this. I mean, don't take my word for it. That's the narrative. That's the official narrative. Well, they want to their spread. behavior on, you know, JCPOA pullout has been more statesmanlike. Wouldn't you agree? No, I was they for the nuclear the... deal, and I was against the U.S. pulling out of the nuclear deal. Mm -hmm. I just thought the U.S. had to find another way of pushing mm -hmm. back in the region mm -hmm. with a consensus. No, I thought that was, you know, their reading was. So, so this I is, guess sometimes yeah. they act like as a cause, sometimes they act yeah. as a. They want to be both. Mm -hmm. yeah. They want to be both. Yeah. Now, uh, you know, again, I, but who, I, mean, okay. I mean, one thing I always found fault with that. It's like it kind of it's this framing that. It's like Wait, Iran Kissinger? is a singular focus yeah. and yeah. singular cause of all the ills in the Middle East. It's like Saudi Arabia, no, they didn't that. want to be a I cause. I never said that. I never said that. The U.S. and the invasion of the Iran. Never no, said I know. that. So I think Iran has its own interests. All these countries do. And when it comes to U.S. policy, I think the best thing for us is that, you know, if we did have a more balanced approach for, to the region where we engage the Iranians when it benefited us and we don't engage them when it doesn't. We engage the Saudis when it benefits us or we, we don't when it doesn't. You know, stick carrots and sticks for all regional powers just it always it's striking to me that when vladimir putin goes for example to the middle east he meets with netanyahu he meets with assad he meets with Mohammed bin salman he meets with Khamenei, kind of Why maximizes russia's interest and then Why he goes out he doesn't give himself in these entangling conflicts but then the u.s we we have this very ideological stance in the region and how we want to transform it and whether on israel palestine ultimately U.S. regional policy is dependent on a host of autocracies, many of them as brutal, if not more brutal, than Iran. So I think what is really also needed is a fundamental rethink of kind of U.S. policy towards the Middle East. But Sina, all that said, most of it may be even true. Can you name another country in the region that has as kind of an almost pillar of its foreign policy anti-Americanism? I mean, yeah, but I right mean, now Iran is the most anti-American so, country I mean, in the region. Where, does that, where yeah. is the space for negotiations? Mm -hmm. For 40 years, that's been the pillar. We will get the United States out of the Middle East. You tell me, right. where does the conversation yeah, it's start? It's about interesting re regime survival. I mean, yeah. it's what's kept a certain I, certain group of people in power in Iran for 40 right, years. Right, right. So the question is, you know, if they give that up, what happens to them? Right. Um, and I unfortunately, think, that I, is the I fate of Iran. I think they could survive just fine by by making some changes, uh, including yeah. how they they position themselves in the U.S. But anyway, that's another. <laughs> I think there's one more question, and then we'll wrap it up. Right, Can you right. hold on? Where's the room? Where's the right here? Thank you. I'd like to take the panelists back to why the regime brought out this gas uh, price increase. Uh, so abruptly, it was so adamant about adhering to its position. I think Alex referred to three resolutions, which were basic in the Majlis, which were basically or essentially uh, dismissed. Thank you. I think I mean I, yeah, I think that's the biggest question about the gas price hike is why it was so abrupt. You know, in the past, you know, they've done this multiple times. Every time they've done it, there's been pro protests. In the past, like when Ahmadinejad did it, he did. He took, you know, he simultaneously with the gas price hike did cash transfers as part of this broader subsidy reform program. Rohani has, is now they're also doing the cash transfers, but it wasn't immediate. I think if they at least planned it better, if they, they gradually prepared the public through kind of media efforts and prepared them, you know, they could have done that, but they chose to do it abruptly, do it on a Friday, 
in this kind of very, it's, it's so I obvious. Think, uh, I don't they don't you think like if, you, if they rolled it out slowly, they would actually grow the opposition and strengthen them because there no. would be more they debate afraid, about it. They were no? afraid of people hoarding gas, is what I heard, that if they didn't do it like this, uh, people would go and buy large quantities just to have for themselves or mm. smuggle out. Mm. Um, so there was, a, there was a sense that they had to do it fast. And also they didn't have the cash to simultaneously give the, the cash payments. Mm -hmm. They needed to get more money out of the sale of gasoline in order, I mean, this is one of the things that, mm. that I hear. Um, but no, I mean, it, 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 it certainly was, uh, you know, the idea of it being a sort of, sort of surgical, right. you know, go in, cut it out, do it in one fell swoop. But uh, we'll know in a few weeks whether that was a good bet, mm -hmm. depending on whether there are mm -hmm. more protests or whether this really has has exactly. been uh, silenced now. Alex. I mean, uh, there's an Iranian joke that says, where do you buy your, uh, the, the most costly cup of tea in the world? In Iran. Why? Because you make the tea in the morning, you leave the gas on all day, keep it warm, because gas is so cheap. So structurally speaking, Iran had to do something. IMF's been saying it for decades. World Bank, you've got to get rid of the cheap energy. So from an economics point of view, this is, you know, Khomeini or no Khomeini or Khamenei, no Khamenei, doesn't matter. They needed to do something others are in the region. It's the way you do it. Do it yeah. The way you do it, and that goes back to the heart of the regime. Who's accountable? Who is accountable? When the president comes out and claims he didn't know, and then his advisors actually he did know, and the supreme leader suddenly declares he's a non-expert on the matter, it shows you nobody wants to be accountable. And that's the problem. Look. With the issue of gas, uh, I think Barbara just mentioned it's important. This isn't just about those guys in Tehran or Mashhad and Tabriz who have a part-time job driving their cars as Uber or taxis uh, getting hit. This is going to have an impact on your price of fruit and everything. And it's going to take some time before it shows up. This is going to lead to unemployment. Factories that are relying on, I don't know how the regime is going to play this one, but if they're going to increase the price of gas for some of the bigger industrial production lines that, for example, produce steel and so on, that's going to result in, in job losses. And that is... They didn't raise the price of diesel, interestingly enough. Right. But yeah, I mean, look, here we're Truck talking drivers. about, we're talking about, well, final point, we're talking about a system, the Islamic Republic, that for years was told, let women into stadiums. <laughs> women want to go into stadiums. Iranian society has nothing against women watching men play. No, they kept saying. No, they kept saying. All the evidence was you should do it. FIFA comes at the last minute and says, we'll kick you out of the uh, FIFA unless, unless you let women in. Then they give in. Why couldn't they see the light before? Why does it have to take the threat of FIFA ejecting you as, as a member? Or the system? liability lies elsewhere that way. <laughs> Well, right. well, yes, they can blame someone else. <laughs> blame someone. <laughs> no, I, I, I want to go back to a very basic issue, accountability, transparency, management. When you have nobody being accountable, then why worry? Do whatever you want. Your you know, Khamenei's official title is God's representative on the planet. That gives you a lot of coverage. <laughs> All right. Well, we'll end on that. <laughs> Please join me in thanking the uh, panel. Thank you.